Okay, let's get started. It's 11 a.m. or 11.01 a.m. EDT on Thursday, October 20th, 2022. This is a live stream for Day 12 of the American Literature One Survey, a non-credit pseudo-class hosted on YouTube and Twitch that looks at United States literature from before 1865. I'm Derek S. McGrath. My pronouns are he, him, his. I'm not on camera right now. If I was, you would see a white man with glasses and brown hair. I'm opting to instead use a slideshow presentation. While most what I have to say is already on the slide, there are some details from the slides that I will read aloud. For example, this slide features an illustration of Mary Rowlandson looking to be cradling a baby while walking through a snowy forest. And didn't intend to time that with the music, but hey, that worked. Last time we talked about Mary Rowlandson's 1682 text, The Sovereignty and Goodness of God, being a narrative of the captivity and restoration of Mrs. Mary Rowlandson. We covered the history of Medicom's war that led to the attack on Rowlandson's settlement and her kidnapping. We talked about how Medicom's war anticipated much later United States history with Manifest Destiny and this largely white Christianized push to quote-unquote settle North America from the east to west coast. We also talked about how evangelizing and spectacle helped make Rowlandson's book so popular both in the North American European colonies and back in England. And we touched briefly on the structure of the captivity narrative as a genre. Both those captivity narratives that came out before Rowlandson's experiences and publication, and those that would appear in the American enslavement narratives of Frederick Douglass, Harriet Jacobs, Aluda Equiano, and Solomon Northrup. And we use all of that to ask why I include this nonfiction work as literature. Today we wrap up discussion about Rowlandson's text. We pick up from Tuesday's discussion to keep looking at how Rowlandson represents Native Americans in her text, and we will look at the Jeremiah structure to her text as well. You can read along. Please use the Project Gutenberg link in the video description for the majority of this discussion, and please use the link in the video description for the Virginia Anthology text for discussion about the book's preface. There are content warnings today for outdated remarks about Native Americans, as well as descriptions of violence, death, murder, and nudity. And I didn't include this in the script or on screen. Given how Rowlandson is going to be describing her captors, there has to be a content warning here as well for racism. I know I said outdated and racist remarks about Native Americans, but... The iconography that she is using is still reinforcing racist tropes. I had ended the previous live stream with these questions, which will guide what is today our last day of discussion about Mary Rowlandson's book. Question one, how does Rowlandson's text act as a Jeremiad and what is a Jeremiad? Question two. What role does Rowlandson see the Native Americans playing in colonial life? How does Rowlandson relate the Native Americans to God's plan? In which, And then question three, in which ways is Rowlandson being sympathetic or antagonistic to her Native American captors? On screen, I just combine these two, more like three sets of questions into how does Rowlandson view Native Americans? Because it's more complicated than just a monolithic view. It's about how she think they play into colonial life, into God's plan, when she's sympathetic to them, and when she's antagonistic, because although I'm going to, not as firmly as I need to, emphasize in the scripts, I'm going to come down on, yeah, she's being racist, but when you're reading this in the midst of warfare and the context, that in no way justifies her portrayals, it clarifies, okay, 
how are you able to sympathize with people that you're considering different from you because she does sympathize with her captors and with people who are Native American that she's around. And yet, no, she just goes right back to the racist dog whistles, the terminology, the imagery to convey what she wants, which is these people were mistreating her. Now, I'm going off script for a bit of a diatribe. On Tuesday, I talked about how Native Americans in the English settlements were in visible presence at all times. This was not something where, oh, we just never see this group of people. They were present. They're still present. You don't act like a group of people doesn't exist. And yet, despite how other colonists are engaging in trade negotiations, and we can discuss at further length during the review session how unfair those negotiations were, despite all of that, was attempts at interaction, and I'm going to argue in today's discussion, Rowlinson ignores all of that to just paint with a broad brush and ignore that there were Native American allies to the Puritans who were fighting with them against Medicom for her to paint with a broad brush because she's not identifying, okay, which tribe is this person with so I can identify whether they're an ally with the Puritans or an ally with Medicom. With her, it's just painting with a broad brush, which I'm getting off script and want to be able to wrap up today before noon. Question three. In which ways is Rowlinson being sympathetic or antagonistic to her Native American captors? I kind of already given the sense of how she's being antagonistic. We'll see a little bit about how she's being sympathetic. Question four, what is meant by the phrase praying Indian, as in a Native American who is in prayer because they've converted to Christianity, or a praying Indian? We're going to describe that in a bit about how, as we can see with Rowlinson, there's this strong implication that she doesn't trust any Native American who has converted to Christianity as she attempts to cite evidence to justify her bigoted statements. Finally, question five, how does Rowlinson portray Medicom in her text? Because, again, as much as it's going to be, yeah, this is an antagonistic representation, we can't ignore how she's trying to couch that antagonism by acknowledging what she appreciated in Medicom's behavior and personality, and yet... This is her writing a text that is firmly in line with, Hi, I'm Puritan. I was attacked by Medicom's coalition. I am not here to act like he is a good guy in this story. And we can have debates about that with regards to when you're in a war story, you understand why this happens, even as you, from your point of view, where you sit in the year 2022, cannot justify that but i'm getting off script so let's get back to what we're here to talk about first let's start with the first question we have for today what is a jeremiah and i'm going to cheat and cite so much from the wikipedia page for the jeremiah quoting wikipedia a jeremiah is a literary work in which the author bitterly laments the state of society and its morals in a serious tone of sustained invective and always contains a prophecy of society's eminent downfall. I kind of broke my rule already, already using absolute language saying rounds and views all Native Americans this way, but if there's a problem I have with this definition from Wikipedia, it's that use of always contains a prophecy of society's imminent downfall. The prophecy would suggest that it is something that is inevitable, that society will downfall. We're going to get to John Winthrop in a moment because his text, A Model on Christian Charity, which we read last week, is a Jeremiah. He wasn't predicting imminent downfall. He was saying, if cause A happens, result B will result. That's not eminent. That is following cause and effect. Eminent for me suggests 
it will always be a downfall. Winthrop wasn't saying this will always happen. He was saying, if we don't shape up, this will happen. Whereas from this definition from Wikipedia makes it sound like, oh, a Jeremiah always predicts a downfall and you can't change it. No. I mean, even Rowlinson's text as a Jeremiah does not say it's inevitable and that there will be a downfall. But maybe I'm misinterpreting Wikipedia because it's just saying it contains a prophecy and maybe I'm ignoring that prophecies can change. But let's keep going. Maybe a first response you'll have when looking at this definition is you'll think Rowlinson didn't really sound like she was engaging in invective. And her text doesn't end with a prediction that if people don't change their ways, that downfall is inevitable. By that same argument, I think you could overlook, as I overlooked initially, the Jeremiah to Winthrop's A Model of Christian Charity. Let's go back a week. Let's look again at Winthrop's A Mala Christian Charity and how he ended that text with the city upon a hill passage. So, reading that passage again. Now, the only way to avoid this shipwreck is to follow the counsel of Micah to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with our God. The Lord will be our God and delight to dwell among us as his own people and will command a blessing upon us in all all our ways. For we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us, so that if we shall deal falsely with our God in this work we have undertaken, and so cause him to withdraw his present help from us, we shall be made a story and a byword throughout the world. We shall open the mouths of enemies to speak evil of the ways of God, and all professors for God's sake. We shall shame the faces of many of God's worthy servants and cause their prayers to be turned into curses upon us till we be consumed out of the good land whether we are a-going. It's not as apocalyptic as you may imagine a typical Jeremiah, but this is technically a Jeremiah. It isn't that bitter like Wikipedia makes it out to sound like, but it is technically a Jeremiah. It is literary work, a speech in this case. It is lamenting the state of society, not a large society, just the settlement they are about to establish once these Puritans get off the boats and go on to dry land. It is prophesizing downfall, not... But it's prophesizing a downfall only if they screw this up. It's actually comparatively optimistic, which is why I overlooked the Jeremiah qualities to it. Winthrop says God will be with them so long as they don't screw this up, because if they screw this up, then the apocalypse will start. Or, not quite an apocalypse in more restrained language, he just calls it a shipwreck. God will withdraw. Then those on the city upon the hill will be an example visible from all sides of the world, all sides of that hill, where everyone will witness their screw-up and God abandoning them. This is Winthrop writing. He was the one leading the Puritans. You cut to enough decades later, you get Rowlinson. She is writing in the shadow of Winthrop's example. I'm not sure you can find a Puritan writer, minister, anyone who was not having to adhere to Winthrop's overall goals in their writing, or if not adhering to it, knew they had to respond to him. That you can't say something and then have someone in the audience say, yeah, but what about John Winthrop? Because he said this, and now you're saying something that sounds a little different. You as the writer, as the speaker are writing in the shadow of Winthrop. So, I don't think you can look at Rowlinson's writing and not see that Jeremiah structure from Winthrop hanging over Rowlinson as she's figuring out, how do I write this book? Look at the last paragraph to Rowlinson's book. Before I knew what affliction meant, I was ready sometimes to wish for it. When I lived in prosperity, having the comforts of the world about me, 
my relations by me, my heart cheerful, and taking little care for anything, and yet seeing many whom I preferred before myself, under many trials and afflictions, in sickness, weakness, poverty, losses, crosses, and cares of the world, I should be sometimes jealous, lest I should have my portion in this life. But now I see the Lord had his time to scourge and chasten me. Yet I see when God calls a person to anything and through never so many difficulties, yet he is fully able to carry them through and make them see and say they have been gainers thereby. And I hope I can say in some measure as David did, it is good that I have been afflicted. The Lord hath shown me the vanity of these outward things, that we may rely on God himself and our, our whole dependence must be upon him. If trouble from smaller matters begin to arise in me, I have something at hand to check myself with and say, why am I troubled? As Moses said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Exodus 14, 13, end quote. After reading this passage, do you now understand why Rowlinson made sure to title her book, The Sovereignty and Goodness of God? The title is saying all of that that is in this conclusion. Sovereignty, God is in charge. Goodness of God, God is also good. This is Rowlinson saying that her captivity shows God was in charge the entire time, but the fact that she was saved from captivity, that salvation, shows God is good. Insert your own pure flicks gag here. Let's look a little more in depth at this passage before I move on. Before I knew what affliction meant, so up to that point, before her captivity, she thought affliction just meant I see someone else, and even despite that person or my own weakness, sickness, poverty, losses, crosses, and cares, I would still get jealous. That despite having the comforts of the world, having my family with me, being of good heart, and taking little care for anything else, I got jealous. And then I went through this horrible experience, and that was God scourging and chastening me. But I also see that if God puts someone through a trial, it's never so much that that person won't be saved, whether we mean in terms of surviving in this world or finding salvation in God and in heaven. Rowlinson is saying, if I had not gone through this experience, I would not have changed. I would have remained vain. She is practically citing the same passage from Anne Bradstreet that we talked about on Tuesday, and we're going to talk about more next week when we do an entire week of just, of just Anne Bradstreet poetry, so I'm going to table that discussion for now. But something still bothers me, that... Over years of teaching and reading this, I've never quite figured out. I had some help from a friend yesterday to try to get a better sense of this, and I'm going to suspend a lot of that discussion until we do the review section later in November. So keep all of this in mind and write in with your questions or thoughts on this, but I'm curious about your point of view. Rowlinson says... Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. But that passage is from Exodus. And her entire text is about a journey. She was on an Exodus. She did not stand still. She was moved against her will, yes, but she's not standing still. So, what is with that inconsistency? And I mean in terms of the literal language. In terms of the, how can you say stand still and expect your audience to understand what you really mean when you weren't standing still. This is not a contradiction, it's a paradox. It's one of those cases where something seems to be contradictory, but once you figure it out, it's not contradictory, it's just a paradox. And I really can't delve into this more because I've been writing 
I've been writing about this question for years, and I don't know what to do with this. And like I said, I talked with a friend. They gave me some clarity about this, but I will address their comments in the review section. But for now, before I share their insight, I want to open this question to you. Why do you think Rowlinson says stand still while she herself was still being moved around? I'd love to know your thoughts on this. Please send me your comments in the video description or rather in the comment section to this video or send me an email, derek.s.mcgrath at gmail.com. Moving on, there is more Christian instruction we get from this text, not just with the Jeremiah structure, but also in the preface to this book. The presumed author of this preface is Increase Matter. That's the father of Kind Matter. As we talked about on last Thursday, Increase Matter was in charge of Harvard. He was one of the big wigs there. Insert your own joke about the Puritans and their wigs, etc. And he would have been one of your best sources to use to write a preface, to lend credibility to your writing. When you have Increase Matter write the introduction for Rowlinson, it justifies the text, not only as being by a woman, and we'll get to more of that when we talk about Bradstreet next week, but to put into the larger context a larger Christian doctrine. Too bad I didn't include that preface in the Gutenberg link, but you can read that preface in the Virginia Anthology link in the video description. The preface not only gives historical and geographical context for later readers and those who were reading overseas and don't know what's happening in the New England colonies, who don't know who Medicom is, what the war is. It's not enough for matter in this preface to get that historical and geographical context for the readers overseas and for the sake of historical preservation for later readers who are going to forget history, don't have the same immediate access to immediate events. This is also matter trying to associate what Rowlinson went through to larger Christian conceptions about how history repeats itself. So much of this kind of writing coming from the Puritans is associating what you go through right now to what happened some other point in history, which, yeah, we can kind of see that. We saw it in the previous passage where Rowlinson made sure to keep name-dropping biblical passages. We saw it with Winthrop bringing up Micah. They want to go back to the Bible to say, we are repeating what has happened before, so we can use past examples as guidance, not only for how to get through this situation, but to be reminded that no matter how bad it looks, it was bad for people before us, and God made sure they survived or had salvation. Let's look at one quotation from the preface. This narrative was penned by this gentlewoman herself, to be her a memorandum of God dealing with her, that she might never forget, but remember the same, and the several circumstances thereof, all the days of her life. In other words, Increase Matter, or whoever wrote this anonymous preface, is insisting there is no desire in this book to entertain or to profit from it. It was not to be published, it was her private diary, penned by this gentlewoman herself to be her a memorandum of God's dealing with her. It wasn't something intended for public view. If I had more time, we would talk about how this is reinforcing a mob was still with us in terms of the public sphere and the private sphere and how we gendered these and made only worse as we are now dragging pregnant people and people who can become pregnant back into the private area because now we want to restrict what they can do further with their bodies in terms of pregnancy and abortion, but there I go being political again. Okay, let's get back to the script. This was to be a private diary. It gets thrust into the public sphere. 
as we saw with Nathaniel Hawthorne's admittedly very manipulative historical fiction, The Scarlet Letter, there is that concern about what happens when you have women entering the public sphere. When you have Mather insisting this was not written to be published, but to be her private diary, do you really believe that? You can't publish something across seven editions throughout your lifetime or close to your lifetime and not think about the audience you are reaching. One of the common arguments in writing is that if you write something down, you're not writing that only for yourself. You do have in your mind an audience you want to reach, even if you know you're never going to share that piece with anyone else. So I'm not quite convinced. This is a rhetorical tool. This seems to be a, let's clarify that she is still, as the next passage will say, pious, that she is still a devout Christian and is not doing this for glory. She's not doing this for attention. This was just for her to process her own thoughts privately and was not intended to be shared with other people. It's it's already hard to not be viewed as a glory hound. When you then add that you're part of a marginalized group, when you are a woman, it's now that much harder. You're now having to do that much more work to justify I am not being arrogant. You need someone else to step in with a preface to say, hey, non, she's not doing this for attention. Continuing from the preface, quote, a pious scope which deserves both com commendation and imitation. Some friends, having obtained a sight of it, her diary, her writing, could not be so much affected with the many passages of working providence discovered therein as to judge it worthy of public view, and altogether unmeet that such works of God should be hid from present and figure, sorry, future generation. And therefore, though this gentlewoman's modesty will not thrust it into the press, yet her gratitude unto God made her not unpersuadable to let it pass, that God might have his due glory and others benefit by it as well as herself. This is the preface saying, hey, 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 it wasn't her who wanted this done. Keep this in mind when we get to Anne Bradstreet, because Rowlinson's story Need this preface to insist that this was our Christian piety and a woman knowing her place. This was a, don't you worry for a second, she wasn't trying to go out there and get attention. I mean, we have to put into this passage, it would have been a shame to keep this hidden and not reveal it again, similar to what we got. I'm trying to remember, I think that was Winthrop who brought up the, you don't hide something away under the bushel. Therefore, though this gentlewoman's modesty will not thrust it into the press, like it's really selling to you the gendering. Like maybe it isn't that. Maybe it's just a, well, yeah, we call her a gentlewoman. What else will we call her? We don't want to just say this person over and over again. We are going to vary the language, but it's hard not to read that as we expect this woman to be modest and yet we had to write this explanation to show that despite her modesty, she still wanted her text out in the public because she understood that is what you should do to be a lesson to other people. But maybe I'm going too far into trying to read something sexist or gender bias in this. I just can't anticipate that you couldn't read this text and not think that it didn't require having men as authority figures and leaders in the community having to justify Rowlinson's text. Now, one of the contradictions is the preface doesn't name its author. How do we know this wasn't Rowlinson who wrote it or someone who's not a man who wrote this? 
even if we can't verify the gender of who wrote the preface, the insistence on we need to justify why she published this, I don't recall Winthrop, Con Matter, and other authors who are men having to put in a preface saying, hi, I need to justify why I'm publishing this because you might think I'm arrogant for putting my thoughts into the public sphere instead of keeping them private. I don't know. I also think there is an implicit fear of Native Americans meeting with white women in this text that could also further emphasize why this preface is here to say, yeah, we know she was a captive and we don't want you to think that she turned against her husband or had an affair or anything. I'm dancing around this because I am put the content warning in that she was faithful. Like, I'm not going to go that much further into the topic for today due to limited time, but just keep in mind this potential fear within this text at any cross-cultural, cross-racial relationships where it seems like everyone is on tiptoes to dance around any idea of someone who is Native American being in any romantic or sexual relationship with someone who is a European white woman. And speaking of cross-cultural and cross-racial interactions in this text, that does lead to the next question we have for today. How does Rowlinson regard the Native Americans around her, both the people who captured her and their families and associates? You need to understand how Rowlinson is struggling to determine why these bad things are happening when God is in charge of everything. Like, the conclusion already spelled that out, that God doesn't give you anything more than what you can handle. But, I do think we need to look at earlier passages in the book to further understand how she's rationalizing, not just, oh, God lets bad things happen. She's trying to construct a chart to figure out why did God create different people in different cultures and why did she create, why did God create Native Americans? In the 20th remove, Rowlinson writes, quote, I can but admire to see the wonderful providence of God in preserving the heathen, again, outdated, awful language here, for farther affliction to our poor country. They could go in great numbers over, but the English must stop. God had an overwhelming hand in all these things. And again in the 20th remove, Yet how in admiration did the Lord preserve them, Native Americans, for his holy ends, and the destruction of many still amongst the English? Strangely did the Lord provide for them, that I did not see, all the time I was among them, one man, woman, or child die with hunger. So she's really trying to figure out, how are the English dying while the Native Americans are surviving. It can't be only that she's referring to why did God allow this violence to be unleashed amongst the English settlers. It's also, how is it that we're starving while these indigenous people are able to survive? And I don't know if she's being ignorant or trying to make an argument because it's like, well... If you have lived that many generations, you have experience and knowledge that you likely were learning from previous generations. You English colonizers have only been here maybe one or two generations, generations being a really limited time span, especially in the time period of increased disease and less scientific advancement. Like, I just find it bizarre that she's surprised that, oh, they didn't die of hunger. Yeah, because they were able to know how to grow food in this particular soil and knew how to predict the movements of animals and how many you could kill and eat. Was she not really thinking through the next step of, yeah, 
they've lived here a long time and understand and have predicted and worked out how to do this. But I'm getting off script again. Let's go backwards from the 20th remove to the 19th remove. Then came Tom and Peter with the second letter from the council among the captives. Though they were Indians, Tom and Peter are Native Americans, I got them by the hands and burst out into tears. So, pausing here, though they were Indians. So, though they were her captives, she reached out and was crying to them for emotional support or to extort information and say, I need to know more about what happened. Or is she saying, though they were different from me, I grabbed their hands. I'm taking this quotation out of context, so if I would look at the larger context, this would be more clear. So I welcome your remarks in the comment section or an email, derek.stomachrath at gmail.com, regarding what you think. If Rowlinson is trying to emphasize, yeah, these people kidnapped me, but I'm still going to make an emotional appeal to them, or is she saying, even though they are a different race, culture, and I have referred to them repeatedly as heathens, I still reached out to them. I'm kind of shrugging right now. I'm not on camera, but I'm shrugging. But recovering myself, so she has to stop and say, okay, my heart was so full that I could not speak to them, but recovering myself, so it's her saying, I allowed myself one outburst, but then got back to normal to persist with the conversation and put some distance between me and these people of a different culture and race. I asked them how my husband did, and all my friends and acquaintance. They said, Tom and Pierce said, they are all very well, but melancholy. And I could go on a rant about the use of melancholy in definitions of depression, race, homesickness, etc., but gotta keep moving. Okay, continuing the quote, they, Tom and Pierre, brought me two biscuits and a pound of tobacco. The tobacco I quickly gave away. We'll get back to the tobacco stuff because, good lord, is that part just so... Ugh. Continuing. When it, the tobacco, was all gone, one, I assume Tom or Peter or maybe just any other person there who was Native American, asked me to give him a pipe of tobacco. I told him it was all gone. Then began he to rant and threaten. I told him that my husband, I told him when my husband came, I would give him some. Hang him, rogue, says he. I will knock his brains if he comes here. And then again, in the same breath, they would say that if there should come a hundred without guns, they would do them no hurt. So unstable and like madmen they were. So that fearing the worst, I durst not send to my husband though there were some thoughts of his coming to redeem and fetch me, not knowing what might follow, for there was little more trust to them than to the master they served. The master in this case being Medicom. We'll talk more about how she regards Medicom in a moment. Just look how quickly her reactions to her captors change, and it's not unreasonable. We understand that, yeah, you were kidnapped by them. Of course you would say, I'm not going to do something that appeases them. I don't know how their mindset's going to change. I mean, not to take something that is very serious that she's going through and attach it to something that, while still serious, is a completely different context. This is like being in a bad relationship, whether in terms of romantic or friendship or workplace, where you don't want to upset the other person, so you're making contingency plans for... I'm not going to send for my husband because they just threatened to kill him. So why would I want to put him at risk even if I could get freed? Because if they're going to kill him, then I'm really not leaving because they're not going to let me loose. So I understand how she will look at this and refer to them as ranting and threatening and that she feared the worst and that like madmen they were and so unstable Granted, it still has to be awareness on our part that she is running from the perspective of a white English settler about 
a group that she is totalizing as one mass of people with, at least in this passage, not as much variety or distinguishing characteristics. She names Tom and Peter. Sorry, I was just thinking about something that I wanted to double check because I want to make sure I'm getting this right because I was thinking, well, wait a minute, Tom and Peter were Native Americans. They weren't the names of any of her children. Yes, because later she says in another passage, on a Sabbath day, the sun being about an hour high in the afternoon came, Mr. John Hoard, the council permitting him and his own forward spirit inclining him, together with the two aforementioned Indians, Tom and Peter. Okay, so even in this passage, we get that vagueness where she keeps saying, they said, they said, they said, and I'm struggling to figure out, does she mean Tom and Peter or just some other Native Americans in the group? My point is, is that she is doing a flattening effect even when she does name people individually because she still has to say so unstable and like madmen they were. I can't tell here if she's referring to I don't trust Tom and Peter not to kill my husband or if she's saying I don't trust Tom and Peter because I can look at all Native Americans that have captured me and think I don't trust any of them and that could be because she just doesn't trust the people who kidnapped her, or she's making a broader complaint about Native Americans overall. Personally, I think she means all of them overall, but I'll explain why in a moment. So, like I was trying to say, in this passage, we can see how her regard for the Native Americans around her and for Tom and Peter does change. It doesn't stay consistent. And I can't speak to how much of this is Rowlinson is trying to represent, represent, reenact her moment of reception. In other words, she wants the writing to imitate the emotion she was feeling at any one time, where she goes from overwhelming emotion of, I am almost free of this, and she's going to grab Tom and Peter by the hands, to then trying to represent... Yeah, but then they said something really violent and that made me nervous. So I decided I better not trust them to retrieve my husband. Or is this not Rowlinson trying to represent what she felt at each moment as it was happening, but now in retrospect, letting those memories influence how she writes each sentence and letting how she feels now impact how she's choosing to represent that moment. I'm not sure myself, and some of this owes to the odd phrasing. You can hear, you can see it in the writing where it's like, yeah, that object shouldn't go there. The subject should come earlier. It's not bad writing. It's just a different form of writing, and we keep trying to create concrete rules to English and then act odd when someone decides to change the order of how they write something for poetic effects, but getting off script again. So, like I established, Tom and Peter are Native Americans, and they, this part I'm not sure about. If I remember correctly in the text, they had converted to Christianity, and that leads to our next part of discussion, which is the praying Indians. The phrase praying Indians refers to Native Americans who converted to Christianity. But before Medicom's war happened, these converted Native Americans were treated with derision and distrust. They were kicked out of their villages. They were segregated by the Puritans into one centralized location by themselves, an island called Deer Island in Boston Harbor. So, yeah, the Puritans telling their, Christ telling their Native American allies hey, why don't you convert to Christianity? And then after they converted, they were like, well, wait a minute. You say you've converted. We want to believe you converted. But at the same time, you're still Native American. We don't trust you. They were already kicked out of their own villages. And then the Puritans segregated them to one location. And that's where they died. 
that's horrific. I mean, I'm underselling that, and I, I sound silly just saying that's horrific when it's like, no, it's worse, but it's because I'm struggling to put into language, you condemns people to their death because you didn't let them find a community. They felt like they had no community with where they were born and where they have been living. And now that they've converted to another religion, people within that new religion also aren't welcoming because they don't trust that they're not going to be, that this isn't a ploy, that this isn't a Trojan horse. Literary scholars such as Jill Lepore in her 1999, sorry, 1998 book, King Philip's War and the Origins of American Identity. In that book, Lepore considers how there is slippage here between the phrase praying Indian and the pun praying Indian. So praying as in you are in prayer, you are speaking to God and praying as in you're hunting someone down as your prey and you are a predator. It's not just that there were indeed books in this time period that, as far as I can see, I can only assume were just misspelling the words. Like, I'm pretty sure I found texts where they write praying Indian and they put in the E instead of the A because they couldn't spell. Or rather, they couldn't spell in the way we spelled this word in our current language. But Lepore still runs with the slippage, not only from the evidence of that misspelling, but as her own pun or what she attributes as a pun by the Puritans. I can't remember the evidence she cites to show, yeah, the Puritans themselves were making this pun. This isn't just something she's making. The pun emphasizes, to quote Lepore's book, that while, quote, English soldiers were thought to be disloyal, Christian Indians living with enemy Indians were thought to be far worse. To punning Puritans, praying Indians had now become praying Indians. And that's on page 140 of Lepore's book, Cain Phillips' War and the Origins of American Identity. This stemmed as much from the attacks in Medicom's war as it was just not trusting them. On the one hand, you have, well, this might be someone from this tribe of Native Americans that is in the Confederacy on Medicom's side. That, okay, this person comes in and says, Hi, I'm part of Medicom's Confederacy, but I convert to Christianity, so I want to join you who are Puritans. And the Puritans have to figure out, yeah, but you were in Medicom's Confederacy, why should we trust you? It isn't just that they're thinking Native Americans are attacking English settlements, so we don't trust all Native Americans. It's that they think, oh, you converted to Christianity, but you're still living with those non-Christians. That's why we don't trust you. Again, it's a Trojan horse. It is a, you made a show of converting. And that's going to come up again as we get to Rowlinson's actual quotes, and I promise we'll get to them, but I got to keep going with this for a moment in terms of this idea of suggesting we don't think you're loyal enough to your religion. I could go into more detail, but I encourage you to think about this when you look at recent news. I didn't even put it into the script of today. Oh yeah, we had that orange dipshit suggest that if you're Jewish in America and you don't support Israel and you don't support this orange dipshit, that somehow you're not loyal to your religion and your ethnicity. Holy crap, that dude can't even be a Christian and wants to pretend that he's a Christian while telling Jewish people how they should run their business and lit their lives and their politics when it's none of his damn business and he can shut up. In the last few months, see, I wasn't even going to get into those recent comments by that orange dipshit. I was going to talk about how we need to have a discussion about Native Americans converted to Christianity in Canada and North and the United States 
and it still didn't work out well. And that is an understatement. In the last few months, more attention has been directed to this history of assimilation and Christian conversion in Canadian and United States history. And I use history when it's like, no, the ramifications are still with us. That's not history. That's the past still having an effect on today. In Canada and the United States, there were assimilation schools. The point was take Native American children away from their families, put them in these schools to teach them to be like white Christian American citizens. What we have had is news and historians confronting the history that even in my research about those schools, I was not tapping into, okay, how many of these Native American children died and did not consider they died, and that is horrific. There were Native American children who died at these assimilation schools, and there were attempts to hide those deaths. Look up the Carlisle School in Pennsylvania at some point, because that is one of the schools that we can look at in terms of what happened with conversion and how these schools were hiding the deaths or had so many die, and we don't talk about that. And since I brought up the Carlisle School in Pennsylvania, yeah, I'm going to get political here as well. You can't look at the history of the Carlisle School and not think Pennsylvania has to do better. And yet, look at who's running in Pennsylvania for governor. You have an anti-Semite as its Republican gubernatorial nominee. And he hangs out with an anti-Semite. And he dresses like a Confederate soldier. And we're supposed to sit here when we've seen this rabid Republican Party just embracing people who had Charlottesville with screaming that Jewish people won't replace them. That you have an, just a fool like Kanye West screaming anti-Semitic, anti-black, white supremacist nonsense. And we're supposed to look at a gubernatorial candidate who decides I'm going to dress like a confederate and think this is acceptable. I know many of you who are teachers don't feel comfortable being political because as far as you want to go, you want to encourage people to vote. You'll cancel classes on Tuesday to get people to vote. And this is a live stream, not affiliated with any university. So I have much more freedom to say no, people need to register to vote and vote up and down ballot for Democrats because this Republican Party does not deserve to be in office. It's important that if you're in Pennsylvania and you are a Pennsylvania resident and are legally registered to vote in Pennsylvania, you got to vote for the Democrat candidate for governor. That's Josh Shapiro. Go to his website. Donate money. Go vote for him. Campaign for him. You can't repeat the injustices and inhumanity that were at the heart of the Carlisle School where you're having children who die there and we ignore it and now have an anti-Semite running to be governor of that state. And that's not even getting into what they will do if they take control of the legislature and the governorship of Pennsylvania to skew the 2024 election. But... There we go being political again, so let me get back on script and back on topic. Let's turn back to that earlier passage about Tom and Peter. And where Rowlinson does use that phrase, praying Indians, when talking about the ransom letter to be written to her husband to get her back. It was a praying Indian that wrote their letter for them. And now this is where she starts rambling about all the problems with the so-called praying Indians. There was another praying Indian who told me that he had a brother that would not eat horse. His conscience was so tender and scrupulous, though as large as hell for the destruction of, pure, of poor Christians. I'm going to pause here. She's going to go on this weird rant about how 
hi, you can't eat a horse. Well, if you read this part of the Bible, you can read the horse. You can eat the horse. And it's like, is there a point to this, Rowlinson? But anyway, just that little jab she has to throw in saying that here's a praying Indian and they have a brother and it's not implied that the brother is a praying Indian. And forgive me for using that phrase over and over again. Let's change that to a Christian Native American. So you have a Christian Native American talking with their brother, and we don't know whether the brother has converted to Christianity as well. And that brother, as Rowlinson wants you to know, had an appetite for killing poor Christians. So again, she's trying to not do guilt by association when it comes to families, but there is something here that I'm not able to figure out. Then he said... He read that scripture to him, his brother, and the scripture said in, forgive how I'm going to screw up calling any of these biblical passages. So from 2 Cain 6.25, there was a famine in Samaria and behold, they besieged it until an ass's head was sold for four score pieces of silver and the fourth part of a cab of doves done for five pieces of silver he expounded this place to his brother and showed him that it was lawful to eat that in a famine which is not at another time. And now says he, he will eat horse with any Indian of them all. I have no idea what point she's trying to make with this story. It almost sounds like she, it doesn't sound like she's making fun of it. Maybe she's just observing, but it's such a bizarre diatribe to say, and now let me explain this conversation I had with someone as we were discussing whether it's appropriate to eat horses in time of famine. It doesn't sound like Rowlinson's making fun of it, seeing as she herself was eating horse during this, and I'm not familiar enough with Puritan dietary habits, but I imagine eating a horse was not fair boatin. I don't know what this passage is doing here. Continuing from Rowlinson's passage, so again, using these outdated terms, quote, There was another praying Indian who, when he had done all the mischief that he could, betrayed his own father into the English hands, thereby to purchase his own life. So now she's trying to point out that the so-called Christian Native Americans would still sell out their own family. Where is she going with this? Like, is she trying to act like they're not legitimately Christians and that's justifying her reaction? I mean, I'm I'm more asking this question to ask a question rather than to be purposefully ignorant. It's more trying to open up discussion here because the implication does seem to be she doesn't think that they legitimately converted Hence the phrase praying rather than just saying converted or Christian. You're praying, you're doing the action, but you're not really that kind of a person. And we can see that when she makes sure to use the phrase praying Indian, and then when she decides to use Christian, and that's in the next sentence. Or next sentences. Another praying Indian was at Sudbury fight. Now, Sudbury was the fight between Medicom's allies and the English settlement of Sudbury. And that was in April 1676. That was the last victory Medicom's side had before his side finally lost in August 1676. Continuing the passage. Another praying Indian was at Sudbury fight, though, as he deserved, he was afterward hanged for it. There was another praying Indian so wicked and cruel as to wear a strain about his neck strung with Christian's fingers. Okay. How are these Native Americans not Christian when they are praying, but the fingers do belong to Christians? And I'm going to take a guess that while it's not necessary, the Christian's fingers probably are referring to the fingers of white people who are Christians as opposed to Native Americans who are Christians. Yeah, it's difficult to read this passage. She says one Native American deserves to be hanged for participating in the Sudbury fight despite that conversion. 
She refers to them as those who would sacrifice their fathers. She focuses on that image of what I assume to be the English people's fingers as necklace charms. I mean, it's not that she doesn't find sympathy with her captors and with Native Americans in general, but it's challenging, if not impossible, to find it. Here's where we wrap up with Rowlinson taking some thanks from what these Native Americans gave her. I didn't phrase that well, giving thanks from what they gave her. Quoting Rowlinson, About that time there came an Indian to me and bid me come to his wigwam at night, and he would give me some pork and ground nuts. Which I did, and as I was eating, another Indian said to me, He seems to be your good friend, but he killed two Englishmen at Sudbury, and there lie their clothes behind you. I looked behind me, and there I saw bloody clothes, with bullet holes in them. Yet the Lord suffered not this wretch to do me any hurt. Yea, instead of that, he many times refreshed me. Five or six times did he and his squaw refresh my feeble carcass. If I went to their wigwam at any time, they would always give me something. And yet they were strangers that I never saw before. Another squaw gave me a piece of fresh pork and a little salt with it and lent me her pan to fry it in. And I cannot but remember what a sweet, pleasant, and delightful relish that bit had to me to this day. So little do we prize common mercies when we have them to the full. She's being given, if not kindness, because kindness suggests you respond in kind, she's being given assistance. But... She still has to couch these as common mercy, something akin to something you treasure for the relief of something as simple as a piece of pork, that she's treasuring the food, not to thank the person who provided it, because as she keeps reinforcing, she's still the captive of these people. And those people that gave her these presents and these gifts bragged about killing other English settlers. That her sympathy always has to be couched in the reminder that, yeah, I was still their hostage. Let's not act like the people who kidnapped me, I'm going to appreciate them when they kidnapped me. Let's look at one more moment of interaction between Rowlinson and her Native American captors. Namely, Medicom himself, the namesake for Medicom's war. Let's look at passages in which Rowlinson talks about Medicom, and she refers to him in these texts as King Philip. That was his other name. Then I went to see King Philip. He bade me come in and sit down and asked me whether I would smoke it, a usual compliment nowadays among saints and sinners, but this in no way suited me. And now we're back to the tobacco talk. Quoting again, For though I had formerly used tobacco, yet I had left it ever since I was first taken, it, tobacco, seems to be a bait the devil lays to make men lose their precious time. I remember with shame how formerly, when I had taken two or three pipes, I was presently ready for another. Such a bewitching thing it is. But I thank God he has now given me power over it. Surely there are many who will be better employed than to lie sucking a stinking tobacco pipe. I gotta pause here. This is her showboating. I had formerly used tobacco, but I had left it ever since I first I was first taken. This is such an odd moment. Is this piety? Is this her trying to look like I used to be bad, but I've gotten better and you can too? Is this her trying to humble herself? Why is she in Maine she used tobacco, but now she acts like she's not going to have it with Medicom? Is this rude? Is she claiming to have abstained so she can focus on controlling her vices, that she's overcome this, that she's gotten better? Is this a power play where she's trying to act like, ma'am, look at Medicom, still smoking tobacco. Thank goodness I don't do that. Tobacco's just something the devil wants you to use, and I didn't fall for that, but Medicom did, so I'm better than him. Or am I misreading this? What do you think? 
let me know in the comments. But continuing from Rowlinson, talking about Medicom again. Now the Indians gather their forces to go against Northampton. See, I have to pause here and just nerd out for a moment because all I can think with Northampton is, oh yeah, that's where the Ninja Turtles were written and created. Okay, continuing. Overnight, one went about yelling and hooting to give notice of the design, whereupon they fell to boiling of ground nuts and parching of corn, as many as had it, for their provision. And in the morning, away they went. During my abode in this place, Philip spake to me to make a shirt for his boy, which I did, for which he gave me a shilling. I offered the money to my master, so the one holding her hostage and supervising her while she's hostage, but he bade me keep it, and with it I bought a piece of horse flesh. And now we're back to the horse flesh discussion about whether it's appropriate to eat horse. Okay, I'm going to pause here. Remember what I said on Tuesday, Native American-European interactions were not out of the ordinary at that time period. This was transactional. This is economics. Trade was how Winthrop said, we Puritans will develop our settlement. Trade was what Winthrop also warned would lead to economic inequality and why he was so insistent on holding God above all else to help each other across economic differences because God commands it. And here, Rowlinson is still engaging in trade. You can't read her text and think, she is othering Native Americans when at the same time she is engaging with trades. Trade doesn't overcome what she says and does in representation, but it shows she was engaged with trade. She was engaged in interactions. This is not so simple as, oh, I'm over here completely separate and I am not part of this interaction with these people. She's engaged with them in trade. She understands what is happening here. These interactions show that it's not as complicated as she was pulling up a firm division between her and Native Americans. She may not be as self-aware or maybe I'm over-exaggerating this where it's like, yeah, she did trade. So what? A lot of people do trade. That doesn't suddenly lead to cultural sharing and sh cultural trade and coming to agreements across cultural differences. But there is something here that I want you, especially if you're teaching this text to reinforce the students, this isn't a text where you are reinforcing to students as if native Americans and English settlers were only engaging in warfare. Trade persisted in and out of war and this is a longer discussion and beyond me at the moment today to get into regarding the intersections of trade and war so i'm going to leave that there for now let's keep going skipping ahead to the 19th remove going along having indeed my wife but will spirit philip who was in the company came up and took me by hand by the hand and said Two weeks more and you shall be mistress again, meaning in two more weeks you will be reunited with your husband. He doesn't mean that in some ironic or sarcastic way. He literally means, yeah, you'll be freed from being our hostage and your husband will be able to pay for your ransom and you'll be released and you'll be returned to your family. I asked him if he spake true. He answered, yes. And quickly you shall come to your master again, her husband, which, yeah, let's table the master-mistress stuff here in terms of what that says about the gender politics of the time. And quickly you shall come to your master again, who has been gone from us three weeks. And after many weary steps, we came to Wuchuset, where he was, and glad I was to see him. He asked me when I washed me. I told him not this month. Yeah, see, I got parts of this wrong. I hang on. Okay, no, it's not referring to her husband. It's referring to literally the person 
who is holding her captive. Okay, my apologies. You will be reunited with your master again, who has been gone from us three weeks. After many weary steps, we came to Wuchesed, where he was, and glad I was to see him. So her hostage holder asked her when she last washed. I told him not this month. Then he fetched me some water himself and bid me wash, and he gave me the glass to see how I looked, and bid his squad give me something to eat. So she gave me a mess of beans and meat and a little ground nut cake. I was wonderfully revived with this favor shown me, quote, He made them also to be pitied of all those that carried them captive, Psalm 106.46. Okay. I misread this thinking it was Medicom providing her with all of this. It wasn't Medicom, but it was the person holding her hostage. So again, we are seeing that she is trying to acknowledge, you know, there were ways they took care of me, but you can't really call it taking care of me when I was a freaking hostage. Continuing now to the 20th remove. Then Philip, smelling the business, called me to him and asked me what I would give him to tell me some good news and speak a good word for me. I told him I could not tell what to give him. I would give him anything I had and asked him what he would have. He said two coats and 20 shillings in money and a half a bushel of seed corn and some tobacco. I thanked him for his love, but I knew the good news as well as the crafty fox. The crafty fox referring to Philip himself. At least as far as the context seems to me. Skipping ahead. On Tuesday morning, they called their general court, as they call it, to consult and determine whether I should go home or no. And they all as one man did seemingly consent to it that I should go home, except Philip, who would not come among them. There's a lot about Medicoms to think here. Like, even if it... He's trying to engage in trade. He approaches her at that last set of quotes and says, Smelling the business called me to him and asked me what I would give him to tell me some good news. So he's saying, Hi, I got some good news for you, but if you want to hear it, this privileged information, you better give me something. He's toying with her. He's saying, like, he's trying to say, I know you're going to be released soon, but I'm not going to tell you until you give me something. And then he lets the court negotiate with Rowlinson for her escape while he himself isn't present. She doesn't go into detail why he doesn't show up when it's to negotiate her release, but that he approached her personally when he had news to say, you are going to be let go. He, I mean, there's a reason she called him a crafty fox and that she's trying to say, I knew the good news as well. It's like she already heard or figured out she was being freed. So why would she give up something for something she can figure out or already knows? And she calls him the crafty fox where he thinks I can pull one over on her and get in for, and get more material goods or even money out of her. We have to remember this is hostage taking, so we understand how each side is doing their best to get something out of the other. Rowlinson wants to be released from her hostage takers, not something that we can't sympathize with. Medicom wants a ransom. We may understand what is undergirding this war even if we think, well, that's pretty unethical and horrible to hold someone hostage. So we can understand the material desires, but also even still sit back and think, yeah, just tell her you're releasing her because you're just then saying, you know, I could give you some good news, but you need to give me something in exchange. So that's to make him seem crafty and not trustworthy, but then... He did provide to Rowlinson. He paid for the shirt that she made for him. He offered her food, and he made sure that the person who was her hostage holder gave her the mirror and a wash. Is that our kindness, or because knowing Rowlinson is the daughter of a wealthy landowner and the wife of a minister, she's a valuable hostage, so you better take care of her, but also 
if she has so much already, you can pull out a lot more wealth out of her as you keep holding her hostage. What do we think about how Rowlinson represents Medicom? He is willing to trade, so his engagement with Rowlinson, is that only on the basis of trade? She is his captive, his hostage after all, but he is willing to speak with Rowlinson and hold a conversation with her. Is that an attempt to show deference? Is she showing more deference to him than she did when she talked to Tom and Peter because Medicom's the leader, so don't push him? Well, if that's the case, why didn't you do a trade with him when he said, I got important information? Why didn't you play him on? Because that's one of the political customs you would do to be like, hi, he says, I want to trade for information. And when you decline, that is considered rude. Like, obviously, if you're being pragmatic, if you don't need to do it, you don't do it. But that's not the point. It's not pragmatism. It's tradition. It's a custom. It's a set of behaviors that you employ because that's what's expected. And the minute you stop doing it, you're going to cause a bigger problem that's going to make things worse for you. What do you think of how these two interact? What? How would you describe their regard for each other? Let's talk about that more in the review section for this live stream, which will be coming up on November 8th. So please get your questions to me beforehand so I can address them and I hopefully can answer them. But we'll wrap up there for today. Thank you for listening to what is the final day of discussion about Mary Rowlandson's book. What do you think? Is Rowlandson offering a complicated regard for the Native Americans she encounters? Or is there a set of stereotypes still dominating her text? Please drop your remarks in the comment section or email them to derek.s.mcgrath at gmail.com. I will address questions before or during the Section 2 review in this live stream about the Puritan authors. That Section 2 review will be here on YouTube and Twitch on Tuesday, November 8th. Time still to be determined. I'm considering whether to stick to 11 a.m. EST, which probably works for North American viewers or for international viewers, go with a 10 a.m. EDT so that it stays consistent throughout the world, except the U.S., which still does daylight savings, etc. Your thoughts in the comment section are appreciated for what time you think I should stick to, whether I should change things by an hour or stick to what things are. Next time on Tuesday, we will continue discussing Puritan women authors. We already introduced a bit of Anne Bradstreet this past Tuesday when discussing Mary Rowlandson, so we're going to touch a bit more on her work when... Well, sorry, I also touched a bit on Bradstreet when talking about Winthrop and Con Matter. We finally get to Bradstreet, so that's going to be a week talking about just her poems. And we're going to look at two of them on Tuesday. The first one, before the birth of one of her children. The second one, here follows some verses upon the burning of our house. These poems are available at poetryfoundation.org. Links are on screen and in the video description. As you read these two poems by Bradstreet, please consider these three questions. First, compare and contrast Rowlandson's book and Bradstreet's Burning of Our House in their approaches to losing their homes. Second, Bradstreet was the first writer in North America in the English North American colonies to be published. So before Rowlandson got published, there was Bradstreet being published. What is in Bradstreet's literature that allowed it to survive up to now in the year 2022 and has made it an accepted part of the U.S. literary canon? Finally, how does Rowlandson lean into or defy gendered expectations for a woman writing in 17th century Puritan New England? In other words, is she offering what you would expect at the time period? Does she seem like the typical stereotypical Puritan New England woman writer? Or how does she contradict a lot of stereotypes we have today about that time period and that literature and those people? And how does she contradict any stereotypes that we probably would expect existed in her own time?
Thanks again for listening to this live stream. I'll close you out with the typical music, which is royalty-free music provided today on Pixabay, a royalty-free music page. This song is titled Beautiful Piano by Mus FM. You can find their music on Pixabay. Link is in the video description. If you enjoyed this live stream, please consider a monetary contribution at coffee.com slash Derek S. McGrath. Your financial support keeps me working in education. Until Thursday at 11 a.m. EDT, I've been, well, until Tuesday at 11 a.m. EDT, I've been Derek S. McGrath. You have a good afternoon. Bye.